Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you adoration, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that you purchase us with your blood. Our life is yours. Wherever we are, who we are, we are yours, O King of glory. We thank you for giving us the privilege to walk with you, to fellowship with you, to do the thing that we do. We give you praise, O King of glory. We give you praise, O Master. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this moment. Even as we hear your word, we receive instruction. We receive direction. We receive correction. O King of glory, concerning the thing that we have to do, we bless you and glorify you. We thank you for everybody that is watching this killing us, wherever they are, in their offices, in their home. Oh, King of glory, the word is coming alive, alive to them, my King of glory. You are speaking to them. You are guiding them. You are leading them. You are showing them the way. You are defining their life, my King of glory. You are bringing them to know you own their life. You are the master of their life. You are the savior of our life. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise. As we hear your word, we get clarity. We receive clarity. We receive direction. We receive inspiration to walk according to your purposes and your will, O King of glory, in this world. We want to thank you. We bless you. We glorify you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Let us welcome all of them that are online watching and speaking with us. Let's welcome them and give applauding clap. Thank you, Jesus. You are welcome. All of you who are watching from wherever you are, you are welcome to this telecast. You are welcome to this service. We love you. And we thank God that you have tuned. We thank God that you have opened yourself to receive from God. We want to bless God for you. And I want you to be stable and be settled as we share the word of God. Wherever you are, just be settled. Sit down, get your book, get your Bible, get your pen, and be ready to write what the Spirit of the Lord put upon your heart. And I want to thank all of you who have been able to come for the service. We thank God for you. Thank you for giving yourself time and for creating this opportunity to be in the house of the Lord and to hear the word of God. We bless God for you. We can all sit down and... Uh, Listen to the word. We bless God. Hallelujah. I know your week has been beautiful. Everything has been well. You are in charge. You are in what? You are in charge. The, the Bible says we rule and reign with him. So you are in charge. You are not lost. Glory be to God. Yeah, last month we shared on the building according to pattern. And I know that most of you have been able to follow it up. And I know that you are building your life according to what God had designed you to build, how to build. God had designed the path that God had created for you. I know that you have been building according to that. You're building your life in prayer. You're building your life in the word. You're building your life in fellowship and uh, doing the work of God, service. Hallelujah. This month, it is quite different, but it's still the same thing, building. We are building on that which God has revealed to us. And so we are going to share from the book of First Thessalonians chapter 4. And we are reading from verse 1. First Thessalonians chapter 4, we are reading from verse 1. The Bible says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk, and to please God, so you would abound more and more, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and in honor. Hallelujah. The key scripture is verse 3. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. Let's read from the book of John, chapter 17. John, chapter 17. We shall read from verse 14. 
John chapter 17. This is when Jesus Christ was leaving the disciples. And he knew where he was leaving them. And he knew the kind of world they were living in. And so he made his prayer unto the Father. Hallelujah. And this is what he said. I have given them thy word. And the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou should take them out of the world. But that thou should, shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Verse 19. And for their sakes I sanctify myself. That they also might be sanctified through the truth. Hallelujah. Have you seen those scriptures? Let's look at John also chapter 16. John chapter 16. We'll read verse 33. John chapter 16 verse 33. Before he began his prayer on John chapter 17. This is the last word he spoke in verse six, in chapter 16. He said, these things have I spoken unto you. That in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. Those are key scriptures that I want us to look through. As we study the word. And uh, this month the Lord gave us the word consecration. Consecration. It's your month of consecration. Consecration is a daily thing. It's something that you do in your life. As you walk with Christ. Now. When you look at the word that is used in verse 3 of First Thessalonians, the word sanctification. You know, sanctification is in two places, I would say. There is internal sanctification and there is external sanctification. So internal sanctification is the work of the Spirit. When you receive Christ, the moment you receive Christ, that day when you receive Christ, the Bible says, God, the Spirit of God came to live in you. You understand that? That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, when Paul was talking to the, to the church in Corinth, he was first of all, he started telling them that why you know that you are going to judge angels? Why don't you make your right judgment instead of going to the law court? And now when he talked and brought out truth, then he said in verse 11, he said, and some were, uh, I mean, that some were, were, I mean, that is how we were. Let me say this in my word own way. Before you received Christ, that is how you were. But he said, but now you are washed. Now you are sanctified. Now you are justified. And so when you receive Christ, you receive, you are separated. You are set aside. God set you aside. God separated you. Hallelujah. And so as a believer, we have the mind. We have that. That is an internal. We have been set free. We have been set aside. We have been put aside. And so God desire what you know, you have to walk in it. Hallelujah. You must know what you, you must walk in what you know. Internal sanctification, God has secreted you. God has set you apart. You are not condemned. You are not judged. Hallelujah. You are in the hand of God. You are completely set apart. And so, you are sure, you are, I mean, you have, there is a divine and spiritual light that came into you. That day when you received Christ, you received light. That light that came into you separated you, set you aside. You became a different person altogether. You were able from that time to turn away from your will and to the will of God. You understand? You left the way that you were living and you began to live the way. In fact, from that time, you began to seek and to know the ways of God. Because you want to walk in this new path, in this new life that you have been brought into. Hallelujah. 
And so God said, you have been, according to the scripture, you have already been sanctified. You have already been set aside. Hallelujah. Now, just like your salvation is so important. So, so important. Because the Bible says without, without what? Without, without salvation, without you coming to know the Lord, without the, you know, what Christ has done for you, there is no salvation. That's one thing. But the, the death, the burial and restoration of Jesus Christ brought us this gift. Hallelujah. Brought us this gift. We can surely speak out and walk in this gift and enjoy the life that God has for us. And so, if God wants you also to be sanctified in your walk of life. Hallelujah. You are sanctified. The day you receive Christ, you are sanctified. You are at turn into the right path. You turn, your heart began to seek and to know just the things of God. And so just like in your heart, God wants your life to reflect that which is in your heart. He wants you to walk that life that is in your heart, that which you have received. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. And so being, this life of sanctification means you agree with the nature and divine perfection. When you came in, when you received Christ, now you are supposed to agree with the nature of God that is in you. And you walk in it. Glory be to God. And so, God now commands you in this chapter, the Bible says, he commands them that this is the will of God. This is the will of God. This is the will of God. Even your sanctification. You know, at that time, they were living a life that is questionable in terms of their life, in terms of the thing that they are walking. And so, Paul said, you know, you, have, you are a new creation. You have come to know Christ. This thing that the world does, you are not supposed to do them anymore. You are supposed to turn away from it completely and live a separate life. And so Paul's call here in verse 3, he said, the, he said the commandment is, in fact, he put it that this is the commandment from Christ, the will of God, is your sanctification. And so the things which are revealed to you, the Lord wants you to believe them. Whatever has been revealed to you, he wants you to believe them and practice them. What you know, believe them and practice them. Put them into work. Do not leave them just in the book or in the pages or in, in your mind only. But he wants you to practice them. So sanctification in the, in the testament, in, actually in the Old Testament or in the New Testament is taken as a holy life. Living a holy life is taken in that fashion. And so now you are different. I remember when we were growing up and uh, we were able to see men of God, the, the, the reverends, the bishops, and you know, the dressing alone, they went, whenever we see these people, whenever we see them, there is, a, there is a way you see them different. You don't look at them like yourself. These are different people. The way they are dressed, the way they live their life, the way they talk, different. Different. They don't want to talk anything which is silly, which is stupid, which is wicked. They talk the Bible. They share the word. Every time they find and they find you doing something, they correct you. They use the Bible. That means they don't want to see evil. And so that kind of life, when we saw, hey, some of us would want, I want to be an irreverent. I want to be a bishop, something like that. Because you have seen their life is different. And so Paul says, this is a commandment. God wants your life to be different. God wants you to show what you have received internally, outside. Hallelujah. Now, the word sanctification is from the Greek word, uh, which means consecration, purification. In other words, it's the effect of consecration is sanctification. The effect of consecration is what? Is sanctification of heart and life. And so it's, it, is, uh, it means 
to be separated from the profane things and be dedicated to God. Be separated from the profane things and be dedicated to God. That's what it means. It means, for instance, you can also consecrate a thing to God. You can consecrate a thing to God. You can also dedicate people to God. That's why when a child is born, is brought to the church to be dedicated to God. You are saying, I'm separated this to God. When, when Samuel was born, the mother, Hannah, said, I will give him to the Lord. And so after winning him, brought him to the church and gave him to the Lord. And so that is sanctification. And it also means to purify or to render and acknowledge as holy. That's sanctification. It means to clean externally, to purify by expiration. That is to make purify it, make it free from sin. And it also means to purify internally by renewing of the soul. And so this is just briefly what it means. So when Paul says, this is the will of God. That you abstain from fornication. You know, he was talking to, let me say this. Fornication does not just mean just an act. It, it, Paul was saying, I want you to know that any person that will either in his heart have this mind. That is, because when Jesus Christ said, when you look at a woman lastly, you have already committed sin. And so it is either in your heart, or in your speech, or in your eyes, or in Levitius, Levitius Gesta, or in the, in the very act itself. And so, as a believer, he said, there are things that you should not do. There are ways that you should talk. There are ways that you should act. There is a way that you should behave. It should be in a line that does not produce or release the Gesta of wickedness. He said, your guest should not be that which looks like fornication. The way you act should not be like that. The way you talk, because we can talk and bring a, a situation which can cause you to do the very act of what you're talking about. And so he said they should get out of that. And so during that time, fornication to these people, to the Gentiles, especially the Christian, they look at fornication as not a sin. For them, it was just normal. That's why when, when the church was writing uh, in the book of Acts chapter 15, they were writing to the Gentiles who are God saved. The first thing they say that they should abstain from fornication. Yes, they are in church, but they are fornicating. Hallelujah. They look at it that like, this is normal. I'm just, we are only two. I'm not going with other people. We are two. And so that kind of language, that kind of behavior, Paul said that is wickedness. You have been separated. When you look at that scripture in chapter 4 in the, in the living Bible, he say that nobody should deprive his brother of this. He say when you do this, when you walk in this kind of life, you are removing, you are taking somebody's wife. You are misbehaving with somebody's wife. And that is not right. And so he said, you have to sanctify, live a sanctified life, Live a life that glorifies God. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. And so, fornication is a sin which does not only affect you in your spirit, but it effeminates your mind, it captivates your heart, it consumes your flesh. And it wastes a man's estate. It takes away your dignity. It takes away your beauty, your integrity. And so he said, this is not good. This is not good. As Paul says that whoever commits fornication sins against his own spirit. You sin against your own soul. And so he said, this is not good. For a believer, this is not good. You must not carry it. And so when you look at what Jesus Christ was now saying in the book of John, Jesus said, and for their sake, I sanctified myself. I sanctified myself. If you take it like you are the one speaking, look at yourself put there. In other words, I don't want my life to cause a stumbling. I don't want my life to cause someone to fall. 
I live my life before everybody in such a way that if they are doing anything wrong, it will be them to blame. Hallelujah. And so he said, let this be your lifestyle. For their sake, purpose in your heart. Present yourself in such a way that your life will glorify God and will be a testimony to many. Hallelujah. He said, for their sake, Jesus knew. In fact, he knew the world that he was leaving these people in. And he also knew the world that these people were living in. And so he lived his life to show to them, I am living in the same world that you are in. But see how I have lived. Hallelujah. I am living in the same world that you are in. Every believer must know that. The Bible says every temptation that you are going through is going to everybody. But God is able to get you out of that. And so there is no temptation which is too hard or too strong for you. No temptation. Temptation does not just mean doing, uh, maybe say, fornication which I'm talking about. There are many temptations that we go through. Many temptations in life. Temptation of dignity, temptation in jobs, in all these kind of things. But the Bible says everybody is going through. So Jesus Christ said, I have lived before them. I have sanctified myself. All the years I have been before them, they have seen my life. They have seen how I have lived. They have seen how I behave. They have seen how I have talked. In fact, the Bible says there was no guile found in his words. All these words, there was no sin in it. You know, let me say, there are things that we speak which is sinful. Even if it doesn't mean saying evil thing. But your thoughts, your thinking and your talking can be sin. Your talking can be dis disregarding the word. The way you talk can be disregarding the word of God. And so when you speak in such a way that the word of God now has no power. That is sinful. Hallelujah. When you talk in such a way that people will be able to, to, to judge that God is a bad God. God is not faithful. That is not right. And so Jesus said, I have presented my life before them. I have lived before them. But now I'm getting out of this world. He knew the world they were living in. He knew the world that he was going to leave them in. But Jesus said, I want you to sanctify them. Separate them with your word. And so that means as we study the word of God, the word separates you. The words put in you are different in life, in behavior, in talk. Hallelujah. Yes, you are sanctified. But every time you read the word, there is a new inspiration. There is a new light that is brought to you. God has put his light in you. And so as you read the word, light comes up anew. And your life is totally separated into a certain line. That's why when you read the word, the word convicts. The word shows you light. The word shows you what to do. And from that time, you are able now to separate yourself into that line that the word is showing you. Hallelujah. And so he told them, I'm going, but I'm leaving you into the world. And that's why he said, I have given them thy word. He's speaking to the father. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world. We are not of the world. This is one of the things that is difficult for us to, 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 to absorb. You know, when you say you are not of the world, that is what it means. That means you are not supposed to be involved in any affairs of the world. In other words, what is talking about the world, not the world in a sense of what uh, we may think, but the system. The system in the world. Hallelujah. And so, you know, when you look at this scripture, like the scripture which I'm reading, and then John chapter 16, verse 33, and then you read, that's why in Romans chapter 2, Paul picked up and he said, Be thou transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove those things which are good, acceptable, and perfect will. How, do you, how are you transformed by renewal of your mind? It's by the word. And so the word of God will be able to choose for you, pick for you those things. That's why your concentration will be on those things which are good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So that's what, now when you look at 1 John chapter 2 verse 15, the Bible says, do not love the world. It says, if anybody loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Hallelujah. 
all that you see in the world. He say when you love it, you love the system, the thinking of the world, the way the world behaves. He said the love of the Father is not in you. Because when we walk away from the love of the world, we walk to the world love of God. Hallelujah. James chapter 4 verse 4, he says, you adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? And so he's talking about the system. And so the scripture is advising, it's not just, it, these are instructions I would say. These are instructions that scripture is giving us. They are admonishing us. Worldliness is not about the material things. Worldliness is a thought pattern. It is a system of conduct which is communicated to believers who don't belong to the world. Are you understanding? It's not, it's not about material things. It is a system. It is a conduct. It is a pattern which is communicated to them that are not them that are born again. And so the world will always test you. It will always communicate to you certain things. But many times, ignorance will receive them. And so it's so important. So that's why the Bible says, love not the world. Love not the system. And so the God of this world, the Bible says, is different from the God that we serve. So when you talk about the God of this world, that is Satan. It's the God that controls the systems that we see in the world. Hallelujah. It's a God that influences and is contrary. I mean, the system which is contrary to the word of God. So every time you find something which is contrary to the word of God being given to you, you have to reject it. You have to do what? Reject it. So it's very important. A believer, you know, you have to live, you live in the world, but the Bible says you must never allow yourself to be influenced by the world system. Never allow yourself. Never allow yourself to be influenced by the thought life, by the system of the world. Because when we get to that, it is very easy to err. It's very easy. You have been in prayer, you have been in the world, and then all of a sudden, the devil appears. Something comes into your mind. And whatever you have been studying, you now concentrate on that thing. And it takes you far away. That will begin to bring into your life worries. Begin to bring into your life anxiety. Begin to bring into your life condemnation. Begin to bring in your life, you know, begin to ask yourself questions like, what have I done wrong? Hallelujah. Because something has been injected. And it's making you look at yourself like you are not anything. And so you begin to think, I think, among the believers, I have, I have not, I'm not doing well. So God's word is the remedy. It's a solution. So as a believer, you are supposed to judge, to see those things. You are in Christ, the Bible says. You are not of the world. You are not of this world. You are in Christ. And Christ is not of this world. Christ is the light of the world. Why? Because the world is full of darkness. And so you are in Christ. You are the one to bring light. The world is full of darkness. So without Christ, there is darkness. Darkness. And so God wants us to live a different life. Live a life which is sanctified internally and externally. They see you, you pick from what is inside. You use it for your life. Hallelujah. So when there is no Christ, there is confusion. In all things. So the only way for us to, as believers to live in this world is by Christ's sanctification. Jesus said, for their sake I have sanctified myself. We have to live by that sanctification. Hallelujah. He separated himself. He made himself different. Glory be to God. He said, for their sake I sanctified myself. So, when you say they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. This is your identity. Jesus is saying, they identify with me. So every time we identify with him, we take on that, the world is out of our life. The system of the world has no ability to control us. Hallelujah. So you are sanctified, you are sacred to God, 
and you are different from the world. So sanctification is the only way that we identify ourselves with the sanctification of Christ, the, with Christ, hallelujah. So our identity in the world is seen in the terms of our sanctification. When they look at us, they see a different people. They see a different people. We are distinguished from them. Hallelujah. By the way we look, by the way we live. Hallelujah. There is something that yesterday I was meditating. And there is something that came to me. You know, when you receive a word from the people of the world, who is, where is your strength? Every time you know where you belong or whose you are. Every time you know whose you are. When you receive something. Let me say for instance, a woman is married. And he goes out and people say certain things to her. Which will hurt her, not so. The place that she will find consolation is going back. She comes back to the husband. The same thing with the husband. Their fellowship gives them strength. Hallelujah. Their fellowship gives them strength. It doesn't matter what people are saying, but their fellowship gives them strength. Now, when you hear the word from the enemy, when you hear something come into your mind, one thing that you have to remember, I belong to Jesus. Hallelujah. You have to run to that place. Separate yourself, get yourself from that environment and go to the master and say, master, hear what they are saying. Make your relations with God be so real. That you don't doubt. Because if you concentrate on meditating what people are saying, you are going to error. Every time they say something, you get yourself out and say, I know whose I am. I know where to go. I know the person that will give me the right answer. And so you get down there. When you practice that, it will become so real to the father. So real that my daughter has come. I must give solution. My son has come. I must give solution. And so do not hear things and go and meditate on them. Do not hear words of men and go and meditate on them. Whenever you hear anything in this world, know where to go. Know where to put yourself. Once you have done that, you will always live a sanctified life. Glory be to God. So, a believer is not of this world. If we do not act on the word of God, we will be influenced by the world. And that is where worldliness will begin in you. You will not find yourself different. Your lifestyle will be like their lifestyle. So the word of God is where you run. So the Bible even says for unbelievers, they say for unbelievers, husband is sanctified by the wife. You see that? And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Or else your children will be unclean but now they are holy. Are you seeing that? And so the Bible makes it so that sanctification here, it doesn't mean salvation. It means, it is used metaphorically, a sin of unbeliever through marriage, that unbeliever through marriage is brought under the sanctification or the sanctifying influence of the believing one. He said, and believing, a non-believer through marriage is brought under the influence of the one that believes. The sanctifying influence. And so are you seeing? Are you seeing that a believer is sanctified? A believer is what? Is sanctified. And so use that life to live a different life. Use that which God has given you, that which God has spoken concerning you, that which God has separated you for, to live your life victoriously. Hallelujah. We are going to have examples that we shall really be happy about. Sanctification means consecration. It means separation of someone or something unto God from a profane or secular channel. Sanctification is a sec in, in religion, it is something which is sacred. And sanctification refers to a place, refers to person, refers to days, and refers to season or objects used in worship. 
your Bible says, use your life, we are to worship God. And so all these objects, all the things that we use, sanctification refers to them also as holy. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Now, I want to say something. A believer's life, as a minister, your life is full of instruction. Are you following me? Our life is full of instruction. Read the word that the message that you know, so, uh, Paul gave to First Timothy chapter one, so First Timothy, Second Timothy, and and you know, and Titus. You find instructions. And so, as a believer, even when you come to church, you have come to receive instruction. Your life is full of instruction, and that is the way that we are supposed to live. You have to take instruction very seriously. So when Paul says this is, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that is an instruction. He said God wants you to live like this. And so a believer's life is full of instruction. And uh, so when you read the word, you find those instructions. Like for instance, when Paul was talking to Timothy, first, second Timothy chapter 3, he said from a child, verse 15, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which is able to make you wise unto salvation through faith. And he said, all scripture is inspired of God and they are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. You look at that. And so every scripture, you come to church, you learn, you receive training, you receive instruction. And so in your book, in your note, you should be able to identify instruction should be able to identify and write separate. They say, this is an instruction. And you have to see what you're going to do about it. It's very important. So the reason you come to church is for to receive instruction. So our life has changed because we have responsibilities. Are you hearing that? The moment you take up responsibility of your salvation, you'll find there's a change. You find there is a change. You find there is a change. Your life is changed. Your life is changed. Why? Because of the responsibility. You have responsibility. Your life has, is supposed to minister to somebody. Your life is supposed to change certain situations in people's life. So you have responsibility. So when you recognize your responsibility and we walk in faith, then we know what we are doing. Actually, what, when we receive Christ, the Bible says we receive him as our Lord, not so. The scripture says in, in the book of Romans chapter 10, verse 8, 9, the Bible says, what says the scripture? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of, self, word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be. And so when we receive that, we receive Jesus as our what? Our Lord. We receive him as what? We receive Jesus as our Lord. And so in Christ, we walk, our walk of faith, we recognize the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We recognize what? The Lordship of Jesus Christ. We recognize who, why he died for us. He died for our sin. He died for us. And so we recognize his Lordship over our life. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, the God of our Lord. So Jesus is our Lord. Are you seeing that? And so, if Jesus is our Lord, the word Lord means master. Not so. It's, it means he is in charge of your life. And so, every time you live your life, you must know there is someone who is in charge of your life. And so, don't grumble, don't complain about anything concerning your life. Because if I am in charge of this house, the beauty of this house is in my hand. Hallelujah. I am in charge of everything that concerns this house. And so everything that concerns you, Jesus is in charge. 
Because you have taken him as your Lord. That's what the scripture says. He is your master. And so it is wrong for this house to complain to me. You have not painted me. Hallelujah. You have not even cleaned me. Are you hearing? I am in charge. I know the timetable. I know when to do what in it. And so we should take him as our Lord. That's why Paul in his life is saying he is a servant of the Lord. And so if Jesus is our Lord, that means we are his servants. That means we receive instruction from him. If I want a job, if I'm praying for a job, I have to get instruction from him concerning the job. Are you hearing me? The way Paul lived his life is a living testimony of what it means to be a servant. There were things that Paul did. His letter states as clearly all his life what he did at different points. The places the Lord would tell him, no. Go this way, no. Preach here, no. Hallelujah. And so it's very important. So a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord is someone, that, the Lord is someone who directs what, who directs you, whom you take instruction from. Hallelujah. So Christ has brought us into his lordship. Hallelujah. How did we come there? Through his love. He loved us. He loved us. And he brought us into what? Into his lordship. And so everybody must know this is what Jesus has done. For me as a believer, don't take any move that will defy you. Don't take any move that will defile you. Don't take any move that will make you like your own master. Are you hearing? So that's why the Bible says this is the will of God, even your sanctification, your dedication. Glory be to God. And so you belong to Jesus. He has brought us into his lordship. So we take instruction from him. He brought us into his love. He qualifies to be the Lord of our life. The Lord of our life. So he's the head of the body because of whose, because of whose we are, we are distinguished from the world. We are distinguished. I want you to take that word. Do you know? Look at yourself as you walk. You are distinguished from the world. Carry that head. I am distinguished from the world. I don't do things like the world. I don't follow the system of the world. I am distinguished. Carry that in your mind. Carry that in your heart. When you carry that, you will find that doing things of the Lord becomes beautiful. You will find that receiving instruction from the Lord will be your desire every day of your life. You will find that anything that you don't have that will not trouble you. Hallelujah. Because he is the master of your life. He is the Lord of your life. And so you have given him lordship over you. Therefore, you must behave like a servant. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. And so, Jesus brought you into this life and separated you. You know, before you were born again, you live an independent life. Are you hearing me? You live an independent life. Now, when you receive Christ, you have to live a dependent life. Your life depends on him. It's just like if he cannot do anything, I can do nothing. That's why he said in the book of, in the book of John chapter 15, he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Even when Christ was in the world, the Bible says, he said, whatever I see my father do, those are the only things I do. In other words, he said, apart from him, I can do nothing. And so we have to follow him suit. Follow him in that way. When we follow him that way, we will live a life which is peaceable. Peaceable. That's why when the time comes for a believer to go to be with the father, he has peace in his going. He has peace saying, yeah, the father wants me. I am going. He does not struggle with the father to stay. Hallelujah. 
Glory be to God. And so Jesus said, we are not of this world. We are not of this world. Even as he was not of this world. And so you are not of this world. You don't belong to this world. The system of this world has nothing to do with your life. It has nothing to do with your, your finances. It has nothing to do with your way you live. It has nothing. The world cannot judge me. I don't belong to the world. I don't belong to the world. They can't judge me. It's on a cross who can give me the right judgment. It's on a cross who can give me the right identity of who I am. It's on a cross who knows my years and who knows how I am to be where and doing what. It's on my him. So the world cannot tell me where to go. The world cannot tell me what to do. God is the only one who has the right and the power to tell me what to do. That's a sanctified life. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. And so, when it comes, so that means we are not allowed to do what we want. We do not do what we want. We do what he wants. We do what he what? What he wants. We do what he wants. There are things that God may, like a father, there are things that God may want you to do in your children and there are things that he may not want you to do. And so we don't do what we want. We do what he wants. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. And so we are not of the world. It means there are things that people should learn from your life. Hallelujah. When you separate yourself unto God, people will learn from your life. Jesus Christ, the Peters, they learn from Jesus' life. That's why when Christ left, Jesus, the Peters were able to do the things. They said, we are not careful to follow what you are saying. We cannot but do the thing that we have seen in our master. That's the only thing we can do. Now, that's the thing that we as believers, we must see. We must only do those things that we have seen in the master. The thing we have seen in the master. Was he a man of prayer? We must do those things. Was he a man of the word? We must do those things. Hallelujah. We have to do those things. Glory be to God. So like when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 12. The Bible says all things are lawful unto me. But all things are not expedient. In other words they are not profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. A believer must not allow himself to be brought under the power of the system of this world. So that you dance at their tune. When they say things are happening like this, you dance at their tune. You know we have a sacred place. From the sacred place, the Bible says, he who dwells in the sacred place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow. We have a sacred place. That is where we get our instruction. That's where we live. And that's how we control, control our life. Hallelujah. First Corinthians 10 verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things do not edify. Hallelujah. Are you seeing that? So a believer has a choice. This is what I want you to know. In this world, when you receive Christ, nobody told you to receive Christ. You receive Christ when the word was preached to you. Hallelujah. Nobody forced you to receive Christ. And so what did you do? You made a choice. So I want you to write, as a believer, I have a choice. I have a choice. There are choices in life that will determine where you come from. If you are a child of God, there are choices that you will follow. If you are a child of the world, there are choices you will also follow. And so choice is your, is your responsibility. Nobody will make a choice for you. Choice is your responsibility. Hallelujah. So you have to choose. You have a full right of choice. Paul says, I have made a choice that I will not be put under the system of this world. Now, when you look at the book of Daniel chapter 1, Daniel chapter 1, Hallelujah, are you following me? 
Daniel chapter 1, the Bible, verse 8, the Bible says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Are you seeing that? Daniel purpose. Choice is a purpose. You can purpose to make a choice to live a life that the scripture says you are. And once you have made purpose, all the anxieties, everything of the system of this world disappear. You will find your focus is in the things that glorify God. And so the Bible says, Daniel, you know, when they took them, the king saw them, they were nice. And the Bible says their names were changed. What the king, what the king wanted was to change their character. They were working a way of changing the characters of these men. The system of this world will change your character. And so you have to be sensitive. And so Daniel was sensitive. He was sensitive. Because taking the king's food and taking the king's wine will bring you to familiarity with the king. And every time you will be waiting and expecting and you be, your behavior will be like their behavior. But Daniel, the Bible says, he purpose in his heart. A child of God, I want you to say, in this life, dare to be a Daniel. Purpose in your heart the thing that you will do that will glorify God. That's why uh, Paul says, this is the commandment of the Lord, even your sanctification. Hallelujah. So Daniel Papas, he made a choice that was not popular. Your choice is not popular, let me tell you. The thing that you are going through, the choice that you have made is not popular. Nobody likes it. But you have decided to live for God. Because after you have got everything in this world, you will still die. But where are you going? Your final destiny is so important before you. So that you live your life for that destiny. You live your life for that place of glory. Hallelujah. So th that's why Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose? He said, it's not nice for you to look at the things of this world and make all your concentration on them. He said, focus on the things of God. So Daniel Papas, he made a choice. And so, as a believer, choice is part of your responsibility. It's, a, it's your responsibility. Choice is a part of your responsibility. It is that which determines your relationship with the Father. It's that which beautifies your relationship with the Father or defies it. So it's very important. Whatever choice, what kind of choice you make is very important. You have to ask yourself, what kind of choice have I made? God will never force choice on you. As a believer, as a child of God, God will never force choice on you. That's why I say, when you receive faith for salvation, God never forced you to get saved. You made a choice that day and received Christ. And so choice is your responsibility. The kind of choice that you make will determine your relationship with the Father. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. God will never force choice on you just like he never forced choice on you on the day of your salvation. So your choice will help you how you will relate yourself with God. In the book of Genesis chapter 39, verse 8 and 9, actually when you read from verse 1, Joseph made a choice. Are you following me? Joseph was in the house of Fort Fire. And the Bible says the woman every day was vexing Joseph. Telling Joseph to lie with her. Every day. Every day. And this time it came. And she said, I'm going to force myself. But you know, Joseph said, I cannot do this great wickedness. Joseph called it a great wickedness. He made a choice that he will not defile himself. Hallelujah. 
So choice is yours. When you see people cohabiting, when you see people doing things, that is their choice. So don't follow that choice. You have a choice to make. You have a choice to make. That choice that will make your relation with your father beautiful. You have to make that choice. People have decided I'm not going to church. That's their choice. God will never force a choice on you. So if you say I'm not going to church, God will never force a choice on you. Because we know in the church I receive instruction. I receive direction. I receive counsel. I receive correction. Now, if you decide I am not going, you are saying I don't want any instruction. I don't want any correction. I don't want anyone to tell me what. The choice is yours. God will never force choice on you. So as a believer, let's learn that this is our responsibility to live a life of sanctification, a life of consecration, separated apart. Hallelujah. So you must make up your mind to do the right things. Nobody will make a life choice for you. Nobody will make a life choice for you. I said before, in salvation, you are delivered from this world. You are delivered from the life of independent. And you are put into a life of dependent. Because God knows your life. He is the only person that will know, you know, have you ever seen a car driving itself? Have you seen a car driving itself? No. God is the only one who knows how your life should be driven. And that is the way that you will live a victorious and happy life. Res irrespective of what is around you. When you make a choice to allow him to drive your life, to allow him to rule, to, to give instruction to you, you will live a happy life. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. So, there are things others will do, but for you, you cannot do them. What did I say? There are things that others will do, but for you, you cannot afford to do them. Hallelujah. When you desire to do, you want, you can't. There are things that you as a believer by virtue of instruction you have received from the Lord. But you are not doing them. Are you following me? There are things by virtue as a believer you have received from the Lord and you are not doing them. And God will not force you to do them. And so it is important for you to know that this is for me alone. Others may not go me going through what you're going through, but this is for me. This is for me. This is for me. Do you see every time you get instruction from other people, how oh, your life is disturbed? It's because you are siding off. Hallelujah. Put no, I, Jesus said, take no thoughts. And so it is important for you to know what kind of life you are brought to live. Not all of us were brought to live the same kind of, no. We have different, different glory, different beauties. There are things that you do that I don't do. There are things that you are so perfect in and it's so easy for you. By the spirit of God, you can flow in it very nicely. But I can't. But there is a thing that I can't, but you can't. So Jesus said, for their sake, I sanctified myself. Hallelujah. I sanctified myself. Let's look at the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Verse 8 and 9. Hebrews 5, 8, 9, the Bible says, He said, Though he was a son, are you hearing this? Yet learned he obedient by the things which he suffered. 
Suffering may not necessarily mean suffering in terms of beating and what have you. But it means the thing that you have been able to endure. Suffering also means endurance. Hallelujah. And so they say there are things that Jesus Christ endured. Hallelujah. And then verse 9, and being made perfect. Being made perfect. I mean, you remember what the Bible says, what makes us perfect in the book of James? Chapter 1. And so the Bible says, being made perfect. He became the author of eternal salvation and to all them that obey him. He became the author of eternal salvation. The author. Let me say this. There are things that you are going through that you, can, the, you are the only one who can be the author. The Bible says he became the author. Salvation is not just today. Eternal salvation. That you are born through what he went through. He, cle- he perfected your salvation. Pute- I mean made it perfect. That once you receive Christ, you are born again forever. Hallelujah. There is no failure. There is nothing. You can choose yourself to walk away from it. But once you have received Christ, you are born again. You are saved today, tomorrow, forever. So that's why the Bible says it became the author of eternal salvation. And so we also need to know that. We have to know. We have to know God will use your life to be a blessing to others. It's all about your personal walk with the Lord. So there are people who are always doing things because they have had somebody say. Are you hearing me? There are people who do things because they have had somebody say. That's not the way a life of a believer is. You don't run with what people have said. Oh, they are doing this. I want to do it. No, it's not so. You don't do things because of what others say. It's not good for you. So you must make a choice for your own life. Just like I said, when they say something, you should decide for yourself the person that you talk to. And that is Christ. They have said this, I'm going to talk to my father. I'm going to talk to my father. I'm going to talk to, father, to, to, to my master. And so whatever people have said, learn to make your life incline to the father. I am not going to do anything about that. I am going to talk to the father. I am going to inquire. I'm going to find out. Hallelujah. Once you make your life in that fashion, you'll find that many things in your life begin to drop off. And you begin to walk the right path. Glory be to God. And so, as an individual, you will give an account before the Lord for the thing that he asked you to do. So don't run with what people are saying and then say, I'm going to do it because they told me this. Have you got a confirmation in your spirit concerning that? And so, consecration, write this, consecration is to make a choice in spite of all other choices. Available. Consecration is to make a choice in spite of all other choices available and be committed to it. You make a choice in spite of all other choices available and be committed to that choice that you have made. You see, Jesus ate 12 disciples, not so. Those 12 apostles. But one of them was a Judas. It was his choice. Judas made his own choice. And Jesus would not force him. He was with him. And it doesn't mean he was not talking love. He was not talking forgiveness. He was was talking to them. You can be in church and hearing the same message, but still go out and make a very wrong choice. So each of those people, each of those 12, they had their own choices. Each one of them, they didn't have the same choice. They had their own choices. A person like Peter, Peter had a humble spirit, by the way. Peter was a humble man. And that's why there are things that so much, Jesus Christ related with Peter so, so much. 
When you read the scripture, when you study, you'll find out that Jesus had a great relationship with Peter. That's why he said, you know, Peter, the devil wants to sweep you as a grain of wheat, but I'm praying for you. The devil will always fight the person who is so much committed to the Savior. He will always, he never talk about others because he knew this man is being groomed. This man has, that's why, you know, Jesus, Peter himself told Jesus, I am going to follow you anywhere. That means they had a very close relationship. They had a very close relationship. So Jesus could tell him this, and he could tell Jesus this. They had a close relationship. All of them, they had their own choices. But Peter chose to die with Jesus. Even though in the flesh he failed. But he chose. He committed himself. Others were saying things, but Peter said, for me, I want to die with you. That means their relationship was very close. And that's why, at the end of it, when he denied Christ, he repented. And see, Jesus Christ, when he came, Peter is the one that the scripture says Jesus had to appear to him. And so there was a relationship between Peter and Jesus, which was very close. Son of God, you can have a relationship which is very close. You can have a good relationship with the master. So I say consecration is making a choice in spite of all other choices available and being committed to it. Being committed to it. Being committed to it. Being committed to it. So Peter, remember Jesus Christ when he was talking to Peter in John chapter 21, verse 18 and 19. The Bible says, very, very, I say unto you, when you was young, you guarded thyself and walked wherever you wanted. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hand and another shall guard thee and carry thee whether thou would not. This speck is signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to Peter, follow me. Let me say this. This is a word that God speaks to you and me. Despite all that you will go through, follow me. Peter had a choice. He was so the kind of death he was going to die. He had a choice to deny that. Let me say, there are things that you're going through which may not be so sweet, but you have a choice to follow Christ or to, or to walk away from him and fulfill your desire. You have a choice to follow men and fulfill their desire. Peter had a choice. That's why when he was finished in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 to 14, Peter said, wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Peter loved the Lord. He loved people to love God. He wanted people to be established in the word of God. And he said in verse, verse 13, you, yeah, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Look at verse 14. Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as the Lord Christ had shown me. Let me say this, my brothers and sisters. There are things that the Lord may show you that you are going through. Remember when he met Paul, he said, he has to, I am going to show him the thing that he will have to suffer. Peter was shown the kind of suffering that would glorify God. That's why in his story, in the biography, they say when they, were, when they got him and they were to crucify him, actually he ran away. But he remember what the Lord had spoken. And he came back. He said, crucify me, my head down. Don't crucify me like the way Jesus was crucified. He was crucified. And that was the death that would glorify God. He would choose to die another death. So, my brethren, there are things that you're going through. For you, it may not be nice, but there could be things that would glorify God. Understand the scripture. Understand your consecration. Maintain your consecration. Maintain your separation for the Lord. Don't grumble. Don't walk away from that position where you are. Hallelujah. So, Peter had a choice. 
He knew he would be killed. And that this death would glorify God. He is going to be killed. And his death would glorify God. Look at that. Look at that. We can read those things and make comments. Like they did not have faith. But there are things that were put already. Look at John chapter 13 verse 36. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither, whither you go? That where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I go, you do not know. And you cannot follow me now. But you remember the, the last verse said, but you shall follow me afterward. The way I am going to die, you cannot go right now. But you will die that death. Hallelujah. You will die that death. And so it is very important for a believer to know the things that glorifies God. The things that honor God. The thing that exhausts God. Hallelujah. Very, very important for you to know. It's very important for you to walk in it. Hallelujah. Are you following me? And so your life of consecration is so, so important. There are things that you should set your heart for and not depart from it. Peter kept his consecration. The choice was his. The Lord showed him. So after 30 years, he kept his consecration. He kept his consecration. Hallelujah. Very, very important. Very important. So there were people that God had called. You know, there are people that God has called to a certain life. But they have walked away from it. God has called you to live a certain life. You have decided to walk away from it. That's not good for you. Hallelujah. That's not what is not good for you. Live a life that glorifies God. Live a life that glorifies God. Glory be to God. So there are people that God has called to a certain lifestyle in ministry. Maybe you are called to be assistant pastor. Maybe you are called to be, you know, I just said you are called to be an intercessor or what. But they have walked away from it. Stay where God has called you. Stay there. Stay there. Stay there. Look at the book of Philemon. I mean, Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. I'm going to close. Let me just read this one. Philippians 1 verse 20. The Bible says, according to my let me say for, from verse 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Are you hearing that? Are you ashamed of what you are doing, going through? Are you ashamed of your life? You are a believer. Are you ashamed of that? Paul says, in nothing I should be ashamed. Hallelujah. I should be ashamed. Just be bold. In nothing I should be ashamed. But that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Are you hearing? He said, I want Christ to be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. That is Paul speaking. Verse 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I choose not. Hallelujah. Verse 23. For I am in a strait between two, having a, de a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Verse 25. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your fathers and joy of faith. You know, Paul had finished his journey. Paul had finished his mission. But there is this thing that God wanted him first to stay, to strengthen. His presence was going to be a blessing and a strengthening to the believers. And so Paul says, 
Me, I want to go to be with the Lord. That's why I say, when you walk in the will of God, when your time comes to go, you don't, there's no pain. You're just happy. And so Paul was happy and he was ready to go. But the Bible says, he said, because the Lord has called, told him to stay, I am going to stay. He said, I'm staying because of you. I am staying because of you. There are things that you are because of other people. Amen. You have to understand that. You have to understand that. You have to understand that where you are is because someone is being blessed. And God has seen that it is you that can do that. Very, very important. So look at what he says there. His desire was to depart, but he said, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay for your sake and finish the mission. And so there are things which are not convenient for you. There are places in ministry or in location which may not be convenient for you, but the Lord would want you to be there. Not about conveniency. The Lord would want you to be there. Can I say it again? It's not about convenience. That's a life of consecration. Once you have consecrated yourself to God, you have put yourself as an only thing to the Lord, then you follow the instruction. You stay in the word of God. You stay in the word of God. It doesn't mean men will not speak. You will hear things coming. There are many things that were spoken about Jesus. They say he's a Lord of the Bezebul. But he maintained his course. And so God wants us to maintain our course. Look back. See where you, you started from. See how God began with you and maintain the course. It's so important. So there are things which only you can do. It's not about convenience. Hallelujah. I am going to stop here. Hallelujah. So what are we learning? A life of consecration is making a choice to follow the Lord in spite of all other choices and be committed to it. In spite of all other choices. Yes, yes, I would do this. Mm, yes, I would go. No. But you're going to stay. You're going to stay. Yes, the people there need the gospel, but the Lord said, no, you stay here. Hallelujah. You can do a thing and everybody is blessed, but you have not done it according to the instruction. And you will be doing it wrongly. That you remember the pattern which you shared on. Building according to pattern. Stay there. God bless you. Can we pray? Father, I want to thank you for your word. We give you praise and give you glory. You have given us instruction to stay on course. To stay on course. To stay on course. To follow the example of your son, Jesus Christ. To live a life of sanctification. A life of consecration. To make a choice to walk with you. To relate with you in a way that will bring glory and honor to you. Father, I thank you that you have already sanctified us according to your word. We have been sanctified by your word. But you desire that that which you have done in us should manifest in our life. Father, I am praying for your children and for myself. The Lord, our life will reflect that which you have done in us. That our life will reflect the glory of your son. We reflect the life of your son. We we'll live his life and was a living testimony, a perfect example that is able, that we are able to follow. I want to thank you for all that are watching, those that are online, those that are in their home. I pray that this word will minister to them, that this word will make them live a separate life. A life consecrated unto you. A life dedicated unto you. A life that you are the master and they are not the master. A life that we depend entirely on you. I bless you. I give you glory. I give you honor. I give you adoration. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you for attending and thank you for watching.